and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters in Montgomery County. If you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat by telling us your school and content areas taught and one of your priorities as an educator. With today's agenda, it's certainly not an exaggeration to say that 2020 is a year like no other. The COVID-19 pandemic, Black Lives Matter activism, and local, state, and national elections mean that our classrooms play important roles for student engagement in our democratic processes. So today, you're going to hear from Elaine Apter, uh, who is a board member of the League of Women Voters in Montgomery County. She'll talk to you a little bit about the League and its role. We'll also hear from three educators today. They will talk about civic education in their classroom. And then we'll start to think about your role as an educator uh, and incorporating civic education into your classroom. Just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping um, for your uh, control bar. So if you, uh, we ask for this meeting that your mic stays off for this portion and that your camera stays off as well. You can see the list of participants and um, you can participate in the chat for now, but we are going to close the chat uh, once presenters start. You can choose the best way that you would like to view Zoom uh, so that you can see the the presenters in this presentation. And uh, you can also choose between speaker view and gallery view as is your choice. We are recording this meeting so that other people can watch it later on, even those who couldn't join us today. Oh, one last thing before we hear from Elaine is that we have a Q&A portion today, but it's going to take place on Google Docs. So in your participant materials that were emailed to you last night, you can click on the link to go to the Q&A portion. Each of our presenters has a section where you can put your name and a question for them. If they have time now, then they can answer the question immediately or they'll follow up uh, by our next session. Thank you to the members of the Civic Education Committee of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County, particularly Yolksan Reynolds and Claire Hacker for their technical support for today. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Elaine Apter. Elaine Apter has been a member of the League of Women Voters since 1974, serving in various capacities in several geographic areas. She just finished serving as co-president of the League of Women Voters of Maryland. Before joining the state board, she was co-president of the Montgomery County League for four years. She's presently still serving on the League of Women Voters Maryland and League of Women Voters of Montgomery County Boards. She was also a member of the League of Women Voters U.S. Volunteer Lobby Corps. Elaine has a Master's of Library Science from the University of Southern California and a Master's in Education from the University of Missouri. Her undergraduate work was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her main career was as a media specialist, which she says was the best job in the world. She was also a public librarian and a small technical college librarian. So now I'd like to turn it over to Elaine, who will be introducing the League of Women Voters and all that it has to offer uh, for not only us as members, but for students as well. Thank you, Amanda. And welcome everyone. It's good to see you. Um, the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 when women earned the right to vote. It was not given to us. It took us over 80 years and then only white women got the right to vote. So democracy, you really need patience and persistence. Our mission was to inform these newly franchised voters about the candidates and the issues. From the beginning, the League has always been nonpartisan. 
We never support a candidate and we never support a political party. Um, so about this information, I said candidates and issues because in many ways, the league feels they're inseparable. Candidates are going to create the legislation on the issues that affect us. Education, housing, environment, transportation, land use, health, voting issues, etc. Um, we're main known for that voter education part and probably the voter's guide is what we're really known for, which is published before every election. And now we have an online voter's guide called Vote 411. And they both give information about voting procedures, dates, candidates, and their stances on issue. And I'm proud to say that this year, uh, Vote 411 got a Webby Award for voter information. Um, again, the it's nonpartisan, and the information on the candidates about the issues are in the candidates' own words. They answer questions, and their answers cannot be changed by the league. Uh, we don't change punctuation, we don't change spelling, grammar, anything. So sometimes it's very interesting to read exactly what the candidates write or somebody for them. Um, just for your information, all the publication for voter information is free. Um, so it, what do we have in those voter education and voters guide? As I said, in background information on the candidates, their experience, education. Well, that was fine, but we also wanted to know about their stance on issues. Okay, we have their stance on issues, but what do we really need as voters? Well, from the beginning, the League of Women Voters felt we need to know about the issues also. Um, in order to really make informed decisions. So we have this league way where we study an issue, the members pick an issue, we study an issue, sometimes it takes two years or even more. Um, we present a fact sheet, which is about eight pages summarizing the issue. It gives the pros and cons about the issue. Um, and it is unbiased. If you read a legal in voters fact sheet for a study, you should not be able to tell which side um, the writers were on. It gives the pros and cons of all aspects of the issues. Then we meet in small groups and we really discuss and, and see both parts and all parts of the issue so that when we answer these quotes consensus questions, um, we really feel that we have a handle on the issue. And if we answer the consensus questions and we're overwhelming majority, what we call consensus, uh, agree on certain aspects of it, we have what we call a position. And this position is there, it's written. We have positions, as I said, on all kinds of um, issues from transportation to voting rights to health uh, to the environment to housing um, and they're in a book and these issues can be used and have been used throughout the year. We do look back at the issues every, every year to see if they're viable and if not we can restudy and maybe change which we actually did last year. Um, Maryland, state of Maryland went from a pro, pro closed primary to an open primary because of the unaffiliated voters uh, not getting their right uh, to vote. So, um, so once we have these positions, we can act. We go before the legislature, whatever branch. And if you join the League of Women Voters, you belong to more than one League of Women Voters, really. You belong to the Montgomery County, League of Women Voters, which is here, you belong to the Maryland League of Women Voters, and you belong to the League of Women Voters of the United States. It is a package deal, and we work from one voice. Uh, we can't have a position on Montgomery County that disagrees or it is opposition to a state position. So when we speak, we really speak one voice, and that's where we've gotten our reputation. When we testify, the legislator knows 
that we have studied the issue and we have the membership behind us, which is really important. So what are the issues? We've been around for, this is our 100th anniversary. We are very proud. Uh, in the 1920s, we worked on the child labor laws. Um, in the 40s, we were uh, worked very hard on establishing the United Nations, and we became the first NGO to have observer status in the United Nations. The 50s and 60s, of course, was the civil rights, um, the Voting Rights Amendment. The 70s was the ERA. We didn't do so well with the ERA, <laughs> but we worked very hard on it. Um, and interestingly enough, in 71, I think it is, we uh, took a position to abolish the Electoral College, which I was just in a session before I came here working on to make that a priority um, at the convention, which is going on now. In 1976, the League sponsored the first televised presidential debate since 1960, and for which we received an Emmy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Broadcast Journalism. And we did it for the um, 80, uh, 80 and 84 elections. By the time we got to the next election, the political parties were putting such pressure and such restrictions on us, we said it wasn't a debate anymore, and we did pull out. Um, and we still get letters to the editor and articles and all kinds of things, bring the league back to do the debates. Um, in Montgomery County, um, we were instrumental in making it a charter county. Um, the Ag Reserve is very important to us in keeping that going. We're working on transportation, affordable housing, education, especially um, lower education, preschool um, education. Um, and what happened is, and we still are in a way, we were all over the board. And we were doing everything for everybody. And we even began to lose um, membership because it was, what is the league? Where are they? What's their focus? Um, but something happened in 2000. <laughs> Very interesting. In 2010, we had Citizens United, which poured money into elections. In 2013, we had the rollback of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 with Shelby County versus Holder. Um, and then we had gerrymandering. So all of a sudden the lead looked and said, hey, this is our basis. This is where we came from. This is what we do. So we established a priority of making democracy work, which includes redistricting, voter suppression, and money in politics. And this from the national to the state to Montgomery County has really been our focus for the past few years. Um, in Maryland, our number one priority is redistricting. Um, so we've really kind of keyed in and our membership has skyrocketed throughout the United States. It's very interesting. We've been involved in lawsuit suits. Um, I signed the amicus brief when we went to the Supreme Court uh, for the uh, gerrymandering of uh, District 6. Um, which was thrown back to us, but <laughs> we tried anyway. Um, so basically, as you can see, the League for me and most of the members is a form of continuing education and growth. Uh, we learn so much about so many things. And in growth, we're on study committees, we're on speakers bureau. Um, we can testify, some of us testify before legislature. So to, to finish the famous saying, democracy is not a spectator sport, it could not be truer in this day and age. And civic education should not be limited to four weeks in a student's junior year in social studies. It covers all study subjects and at all levels. So I hope the following sessions will inspire you to help your students realize how exciting civics can be and how important it is to their future and the future of our country that they are involved and knowledgeable about the democratic process. 
So have a great workshop. Thank you so much, Elaine. I think it's great that you have highlighted, a lot of times people think the League of Women Voters is only about issues of making democracy work. And while that's really important, as you highlighted, there are a wide variety of topics that are also incorporated into the League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. So um, I would encourage now, if you have, if you're a participant and you have not had a chance to look at the participant materials, that I emailed you yesterday, now would be a great time to go ahead and open those up. In the participant materials, you'll see three really important things. The first thing that you'll see is current opportunities for student involvement in the League. The League, of course, welcomes you as a member, but we also welcome student members. And everything that the League is doing, we would love to have student involvement in those things. The League of Women Voters is also an approved uh, group that can give student service learning hours. Even in this virtual time, we are doing projects that students can earn SSL hours through. So if you have students who would be interested in joining the League uh, or interested in earning SSL hours through us, please uh, encourage them to contact us. I've given you examples in your participant materials of things that we would love student involvement with and some of our current SSL projects that students can get involved with. Additionally, in your participant materials, you have a guided exploration of two websites, the League of Women Voters United States website and the League of Women Voters Montgomery County website. These two websites are really the heart of a lot of the materials that you will be able to use in your classroom. So the League of Women Voters has a lot of the history of the United States League, but in the Montgomery County website, we also have, for example, the fact sheets, the position papers, the consensus that Elaine was talking about. So a lot of materials that you would be able to incorporate in your classroom. And speaking of incorporating in your classroom, today you'll hear from three teachers who have done civic education projects in their classes. After hearing from them, we invite you to create your own civic education project. We can um, help you as a league, we can help you to incorporate some of our materials into your classroom, or we can help you in other ways that you see fit as you incorporate civic education, as Elaine said, uh, it's not enough to just have civic education siloed in one class in high school. We want to make sure that all content areas and in a variety of grades are promoting civic education in their classes. So we're going to hear from three teachers today. Uh, we'll hear from George Mayo, Megan Pankowitz, and myself. So first, I'd love to introduce uh, George Mayo. He first taught middle school English in film production for eight years before transitioning to high school. He currently teaches film and TV production in the communication arts program at Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring, Maryland. During his presentation, I would invite you to use our Q&A Google Doc where you can ask him questions uh, about his presentation and he will follow up as he's able. So without further ado, here is uh, George Mayo. Hi, um, thanks um, for <clears throat> inviting me to be part of the workshop tonight. Um, I have slides. I don't know if we're gonna be able to go through the slides, but I wanted to, I will briefly say before we show a video, hopefully we can show a video and about uh, some kids that two of my students made this year for a C-SPAN contest. Um, and it's all about the importance of civic engagement and teaching civic engagement in schools. Um, and the idea that that is what is the force behind a strong democracy. And they, they made a really powerful film um, and they won second place uh, in the national C-SPAN contest for it. Will we, will we be able to, I know we were talking about different ways of maybe showing that, but after I talk a little bit about the project, taking a moment and having giving uh, everyone time to 
look at that or try to stream it through Zoom? What were you thinking? Yeah, George, I think that'll be great. So uh, can you see my, can you see the slides? I have your slides pulled up. Are you not able to see them? I don't know why I don't see them. I can see them, Amanda. Okay. So you're on the, the first one. I'll, I'll go through. I, I'm in the, the second slide now. It has a picture of the two young ladies. I don't see it, but if that's, if that's the one you have up. Um, yes. There I we go. I don't see yours. It's, it's interesting. I don't, let me make this. Okay, here we go. I got it. So um, even though I am a film production te teacher, but I work in a program called Communication Arts Program, and it's very project-based, um, and students have a lot of opportunity to work in groups to research um, issues uh, and topics that are currently going on that they just really care about. And so for this particular project every year, um, C-SPAN has this really great contest um, called Student Cam, and we've been doing it for five years. And the students do really well. We put a lot of energy into it. It takes us about four months from start to finish. And we spend quite a bit of time researching and creating um, uh, voter guides, interesting enough, which um, we, we just heard about. And I, I'm really curious to see those voter guides. So I'll talk, the, even though I'm a, as a film teacher, um, I work with a team of teachers. I work with an English teacher, uh, 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 a government teacher, and a journalism teacher. So it's, we're very collaborative in how we approach this project. But basically students um, pick topics of their choosing. They can, they, they have, it's pretty open-ended and the prompts are usually open-ended as well for C-SPAN. And then we, you know, we spend a, a good, we spend four months um, researching, reaching out for interviews. Um, a lot of students travel to Capitol Hill and, and just all over the area. Some students have traveled out of state to do interviews. Um, and they, they put these films together. Um, and so the one this year, um, oh yeah, and I'll talk a little about the value of participating in Student Cam. Um, and you can kind of see a list that I put on this slide. If you go to the next slide. There, you know, there's, there's so much they get out of it, it's, which is true with so much project-based learning, but they, um, they have to take, they have to learn how to work independently. They have to reach out for these um, interviews. Uh, and arrange them and schedule them. And I have a, a kind of a deal set up with the school and the program where that students can actually leave campus during the school day for certain blocks in order to conduct interviews for this project. Um, but they, you know, they do tons of research. They have to organize that research. They have to learn, learn how to conduct these professional uh, interviews. Many of them sometimes are going, like I said, to Capitol Hill and, and, and talking to um, people in Congress. And, and they have to take all this information, what they've researched and all their interviews and some foot, and footage that they've shot, and they have to put it together um, into this cohesive documentary um, that has to be, that has to si show all the different sides of the topic. So even though they are typically leaning toward one side of the issue, it has to be a well-balanced approach to the issue, which I think is a really important component um, of this project. So it's not just all one-sided, you know, they're, they, um, they really have to delve into opposing viewpoints. And I've had many times, it's not unusual that students start on one side of a topic and after interviewing people and learning more about it, they adjust their original thinking. And sometimes they change their, their, their opinion altogether um, just from what they've learned through the project. Um, um, and so there is a lot, and I think it's really powerful in this day and age to, to have students, you know, create their own digital media. They consume media and they know, um, you know, it, it's just obviously a constant presence in their lives. So for them to be able to create something, oftentimes at the end of the project, the kids are very surprised and very proud of what they've created. And even though we often win, like the students, the film I'm going to show you, they won $1,500 and they split the money between the two of them. And I know that the money is a motivator for a lot of students, but I, I tell them, you know, at the end of the day, whether you win anything or not, you create these films that you get to share with the world about topics that you really do care about. And, and so they, at the end of the project, they are often very, very proud and happy with what they've created. Uh, certainly, um, whether or not they've, they've won anything. Um, so we go to the next slide. Those are the two students, Lintaro and Young Ben. So I had them in 10th grade, and then I had the young lady, young Ben, in my TV program for, the, for her 11th, 11th and 12th grade. 
and Lentaro and her friends, and they wanted to do C-SPAN again during their, uh, this past year. So they, they created this great film that was one of the best films we've ever made um, called Democracy Must Be Learned, Civics Education and Youth Engagement. And they just did an amazing job just getting interviews, conducting the interviews, putting it all together, researching it. And so we could take, it's, it's, it's six minutes before credits and the, the, the film runs right up to the six minutes. So I don't know if we either watch it through Zoom or if everyone just clicks on the link and, and, and spins, maybe we just give them a seven minute block to, to watch the video. I'm not sure what would work best. I know sometimes video on Zoom is a bit, can be a little quirky. Sure, why don't we go ahead and try to watch it and uh, maybe in the, uh, maybe you guys can let me know if there is a problem and then we could just, uh, have a short break to have everyone watch it on their own. We founded this organization a week after the Parkland shooting to give DMV students a voice in the fight for stricter gun control. We have proven that now is the time for change. <laughs> This is Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring, Maryland, one of thousands of educational institutions that are fueling youth activism. From the March for Our Lives to the Climate Strike Fridays for Future movement, millions of youth have involved themselves in the political process. But youth involvement in politics is nothing new. Sometimes it's a cause, sometimes it's a war in particular, especially if people feel they're going to be drafted. Sometimes it's a period when people feel their voices aren't being heard. Often at the same time, people participate because they want to play a role. They want that self-identity, that they're an important contributing member of society, that they play a role in government. And so there are periods when young people have found their way into politics, men and women, white and African American, and all different racial populations, because they want to play a role, because it says something to them about their involvement in their citizenship. It's a way of, of announcing your, your role in society. If anything, youth engagement has fallen off from its historic highs. In the 1972 election, the first election in which 18 to 20 year olds were eligible to vote, 55% of youth voters cast ballots. Youth voter turnout has never reached that number again. This status quo is the result of a decades-long crisis in American civics. Schools across America once taught constitutional and civic principles as an educational requirement. But according to an American Progress Center report, only nine states and the District of Columbia currently require at least one year of government classes in high school. The lack of concentrated civic curricula in our schools violates a basic principle of American government, the educated citizen. The founders of American constitutional democracy understood that power and knowledge go together. And uh, if you want to have uh, your little particle of the sovereign power that is citizenship, you need to empower yourself with education. The consequences of a decline in civics classes are harrowing. Let me start with another analogy, which is that when you learn to drive a car, your parents do not simply hand you the keys to a Ferrari. Um, that's a very powerful engine, a very powerful beast. Democracy is like that too. And what having a, a, an instruction course and the car manual does for you is give you all the tools that you need to know, even if you haven't put them in action yet, of how things are supposed to work. Um, and that's what civic education does, uh, definitely. It helps you understand the purposes of things, but also the grander scheme of things. How are youth expected to become the stewards of our democracy when they're not even taught how democracy works? The more they understand uh, through civic education the importance of that vote mm -hmm. and that they really can change things. I mean, the fact that the House is controlled by Democrats or Republicans or vice versa is going to lead to dramatically different policy. Uh, so stepping up, and it's really a responsibility to vote. The YMCA has helped meet this need through its youth and government model government programs. 
Uh, for youth in government, we play a, we, we, we kind of serve as intermediary. We help schools and teachers uh, get, provide students with ways to make transformational change in their communities. Uh, we ask students, what are things that you want to see done differently in your community? What are things that you want to improve? What are some of the problems you think aren't part of the conversation at your schools right now? We give them a platform to do that. Others call for instituting robust programs of civic instruction back in American schools. So from my vantage point, the whole purpose of public schooling is civic education. It is to create and to prepare students for their important roles as citizens. So it's hugely problematic when schools aren't doing that, or at least to the degree or scale or breadth that, that we would hope. Even others stress that civics education should be more than just a schooling initiative, but rather a holistic process socializing youth to politics. You know, solely having a civics class or a civics requirement isn't enough. Um, it has to be something that is relevant to young people, where young people have a voice in it, where, you know, we talked about the skills that civic education can um, manifest and learning how to have discussions with people who may disagree with you. No matter how civics education is accomplished, however, its benefits are clear. Civics education equitably and universally gives young people the opportunity to learn about how the system works. Our vision for 2020 is for civics education to reach the forefront of the presidential administration's agenda. We want to encourage millions of formerly disengaged people to vote in 2020 and beyond. When youth are given the opportunity and the skills to become informed voters and engaged citizens, they vote because democracy must be learned. What is the ability to read, write, and calculate if we don't understand the civic actions that will secure our future and keep it on a prosperous trajectory? You cannot build the roof before you lay the foundation. Okay, great. Um, I just, I love that film. And when pieces of work like that come out of my classroom, like, cause they just, it's interesting when you give kids the opportunity to, to create projects, they sometimes push so far beyond um, what I've taught them. <laughs> you know, like, so you just give them the opportunity to, to just fly. Like it would, um, I'm an English teacher by training and I just kind of fell into film production cause I loved how I could basically still teach English. Um, but like with a really in a hands-on approach. And so that film, I don't know if you guys watched all the way through to the end, but it's kind of a powerful moment where they cut to a C-SPAN clip and then they cut back to Lentaro, or no, it's just a voiceover of Lentaro. And then they show the kids kind of coming out of the school really slowly. And he's just kind of, and it's a voiceover basically saying, you know, you have to teach DeMarc, it's not, it's something you have to teach. Um, and so I was just um, really blown away by the job they did on that. Um, there, are, I don't know if you guys have questions about that film, or we hold the questions in the in the Google Doc only. But there are a couple of um, there's two um, resources that I created that I think um, have really helped us a lot, and that are shared on the Student Cam website. Because I was lucky to get a fellowship there two two summers ago, and we so I was developed some of the resources that my team and I have created, and I work with this really amazing group of teachers, uh, and the government teacher. Um, is from, used to work at Parkland. I know there's a Parkland teacher on here. Uh, her name is uh, Miss Russell. I don't know if, I'm not sure what teacher, but anyway, she helped create um, both of these next things, the voter guide in particular. So if we want to, do you have the next slide where it says student cam resources? Okay. Um, if we click on, can we click on voter guide and bring that up? 
and then just scroll down. It's a short video. I don't know. Do we have time to watch it and to try to play it to see if it plays? Because it's the kids basically explaining it. Sure. Let's see if it works. Okay. There's a slight hesitation before it starts, so it might seem like it's freezing, but. Well, the voter guide was definitely helpful because before we started it, we didn't have any idea really of any of the sides of the topic. We had just decided what we wanted. So doing the voter guide allowed us to, what it was is we put together, we described what the issue was. And then on one side we described, we just basically described the um, two views, the two opposing opinions on a certain topic. And I, I did um, greenhouse gases, and so I decided um, regulations or no regulations. And that really was very helpful because it allowed me to understand sort of what the points I wanted to be making was and to really see the other side and so how I'd be able to refute it once I did my documentary. Um, and I definitely said it was a great way to start the project because it was a good way to start research but without having to worry about writing the script yet. So I think what the voter guide really did was it helped us uh, start some preliminary research about our topic and not only just start research for our argument but also look into the other side's argument to kind of uh, gain a more well-rounded point of view about the topic and to become experts on it rather than just uh, only have information on one side of the topic. Um, given that the voter guide kind of gave us a like uh, kind of a blueprint for our research as we headed into this project, it definitely helped us narrow down um, the different topics surrounding bump stocks that we wanted to focus on and uh, just kind of streamline our research to make everything go more efficiently. Okay, so for my group specifically, we our final product ended up being about the racial disparities in the criminal justice system. And what our voter guide did was help us get to that point because initially we were stuck and confused on whether we wanted to talk about the prison pipeline, how the prison pipeline is majority major is filled majority with um, with color, people of color, and um, we didn't know which angle we wanted to approach it at. If we wanted to start at the beginning with the prison pipeline, or if we wanted to talk about people in prison themselves. So the voter guide kind of helped us to see where there was more research and where there were more facts and kind of helped us to realize that there was more of an issue in the current criminal justice system with those who are currently incarcerated. Oh yeah, 100%. Um, the voter guide was definitely like a strong foundation and a base uh, for making our whole documentary. It, it helped us do a lot of the research. It showed us both uh, sides of the argument. Um, and it, it was uh, overall like a great way to, um, to like lay the foundation for our C-SPAN film. Okay, so um, am I? Am I muted? I hear you. Yes. Okay. okay. So yeah, the voter guide is something that Miss um, Russell came up with, um, the government teacher, and basically, you know, as, as anyone who's done pro uh, research project, the students know that topic selection is really important, and if they choose a topic that um, is too wide or just too large in scope. Or they choose a topic they're not they're not really interested in because they're but you know because their friends are doing it or something like that they get stuck with this project for four months they have to deal with so the voter guide really makes them sort of find out first off who who are the major players in the topic what are the different opposing viewpoints where where do we stand and 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 where how are we going to sort of start to drill down and be more specific with what we're looking at so the voter guide kind of forces them to do that and oftentimes through the voter guide students will either at the end change their topic completely uh or they'll they'll um, learn something new throughout the process and kind of change the direction that they're going and then that leads us up to the next thing which because we're always um when you're trying to do project-based learning in, in our typical high school or any public school system it's really like putting a circle in a square, so to speak. It just, it's not built for it. So like we're always pushed for time. So I have, we developed another thing called the research outline. So that's, you know, they've chosen their topic. They've really driven it down, drilled it down. They have to, before they start researching, they have to literally outline. It's basically, I tell them, look, it's a persuasive essay. And you've written a gazillion of those, right? You have the hook, the thesis, 
um, maybe some kind of antidote in the, you know, an intro and you're going to have like a couple of main ideas that you have to develop throughout your. So I have them chunk their, their research. So when they start researching right out of the gate, they have to have very specific, you know, they find something that needs to go into this outline somewhere. And if it doesn't go, if it doesn't fit, but they think it's really important, they need to reevaluate that outline. Uh, and so as they're researching, they're also laying out the structure of their film at the same time. So by the time they're done, after the, you know, two or three weeks of researching, uh, simultaneously reaching out for interviews, they've got a, a, this outline laid out that's already in a structure. So when they go to write the script, they can just kind of pull the pieces. And then I start to tell them within each section of the outline, they have to prioritize what they think is really important or what they want to say as a voiceover or if an interviewee says it. So the, there's a lot of critical thinking at that point, but the research outline is the next phase. And I feel like it's really just helps direct students. And another thing I like about it is they use Google Docs. So they have to color code their research mm -hmm. um, because I have them work in groups of two or three. So I like to sit down with them and say, like, hey, so and so, what? show me what you're up to. Like what part of the outline are you doing? Where are your notations? Um, why aren't there parenthetical citations in your outline? Like, you know, what what is it that you're adding? Or, or you know, why is there nothing here from you? <laughs> um, so it's just kind of a good way of trying to hold kids accountable as they go through the process. And it, it really helps kind of streamline their research and, and keep them focused on where they're going um, throughout. And then again, it, it is a benefit when they uh, move to the next phase of writing, of writing their script and putting their script together. Um, George, would it be helpful if I showed the research outline video that's on the site? Yeah, that would be great. It's also short like the other one, so. Great. Okay, I'll go ahead and play that now. Okay. So our, the research outline, uh, we, came up with our overarching topic first, which was not too hard to do, but as we started to look into it, we wanted to split everything up into maybe three or four different main points. Um, and so, excuse me, that really helped to take our research and not just kind of go around and find sources and find arbitrary information, but to find information that really helped our argument and to plug it in to this outline under these different categories in these different uh, section of the sections of the outline in order to kind of uh, have a direction of where our documentary was headed. So every little piece of research, whether it be um, a super small little detail or super main idea, we had to make sure that it made sense in terms of where it fit in our documentary. So it wasn't just kind of thrown in there to kind of just be a random fact. Um, it actually had to uh, contribute to the flow of the documentary and contribute to the flow of our research. So um, our film was about the lack of justice for Native American women who are sexually assaulted or raped by non-Native men, um, especially on reservations. Um, and the main points of our film were that because of the messy jurisdiction where the federal government had jurisdiction and tribes were not given jurisdiction over their own land um, in major crimes such as sexual assault or rape, our main point was because of that there's a lack of justice. Um, so the storyline that we kind of made following our main points were first we established that it was a really big problem, that there were so many victims who did not get any justice at all. Then we described or explained why that was the case, um, gave a little background with the uh, Violence Against Women Act and wrapped up with talking about how this could be solved. Well, I mean, so the research outline was like the basic formula that we were using for filming. So we would put all of our research into there and it would it would outline like the steps and our talking points in the documentary. So that like really helped us when we were putting everything together because we already had our ideas, our research and everything was there and we can just translate it into the film. As we researched, we knew where we wanted to put it into the film. And so we were able to really specify our research to what would help us best. And so it was definitely good, the process of the voter guide, the research to narrow down what we wanted to do, which then gave us really specific questions to ask people during interviews and really specific B-roll to find. Well, it, it was very good at keeping the uh, project on track. There wasn't a lot of, um, you knew what you were doing each step of the way. Okay. Uh, and you knew where you were going with it. And I think that that was helpful because you, there wasn't any moment where you were sitting and you're like, what do I do? 
what am, what am I supposed to be doing now? You always knew what you were supposed to be doing. You always knew you, you had an outline, you had a plan, and you could stick to that. And it helped to get everything done on time. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and another thing about the, the research outline that came in handy is that once they, as they were doing their research and kind of plugging in their outline and developing what they're doing, um, they also simultaneously were reaching out for interviews. And, and then that was a really great way of generating questions. So like, you know, the questions when they went out for an interview, it wasn't like just random questions. It was like questions very pointed toward kind of the direction that they thought they were going in the documentary. That doesn't mean to say that they, many of them go into on interviews and come back and completely revamp um, the, 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 the direction they were going. Cause you know, they, they we're lucky we live here in DC. There's so many think tanks and, nonprofits and Capitol Hill and people um, that are so open with their time. So they were able to go out and really get um, some powerful research. I mean, their most powerful research is coming from, <clears throat> from the interviews, but that research outline does help them kind of generate questions about where they think they're going. So it kind of they, everything again, like fits in sort of this sort of structure um, as they see it. Um, but it is constantly like with any research project or project based, you know, it is evolving and changing as they go through the, as they go through the process. So those are the two. Those are the two main resources that um, created last year for the C-SPAN fellowship um, that they still have up. And beyond that, then it just really big, messy project um, like project-based learning. And um, you know, in, in the end, it all comes together. Um, I like the, the film that you showed tonight. I'm particularly proud of just because of the topic and the, the, just the amount of work that they did. And that was completely voluntary. That wasn't even part of the class. Like both of them, I just did it in my 10th grade class and one was my current student, my TV production program, but they just, you know, did all of that work um, on their own. Uh, and they clearly like, you know, care, care about that topic. Um, so I think, yeah, that's basically the main gist of what I have to share tonight. Great, thank you so much, George. Those videos were so helpful. And uh, we have linked all of the materials that George has shared in the participant materials uh, for other people to adapt for their classroom. So thank you so much, George. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask George, please add it to the Google Doc and he can respond after uh, this portion of the session or as he's able if it's a little bit of a longer question. Okay. So thank you so much, George. Sure, you're welcome. So now I'd like to uh, invite Megan Pankovich to uh, present. She is a national board certified teacher with over 10 years of experience in the secondary English language arts classroom. She has received distinctions, including the National Council of Teachers of English High School Teacher of Excellence Award. She has served as President and Executive Director of the Florida Council of Teachers of English. And Megan currently works at Rockville High School as a Staff Development Teacher, AP Coordinator, and AP Language Teacher. She's also a co-author of The Language of Composition, the third edition. And as we go through Megan's presentation, you can also put questions for her in the Q&A Google Doc. So Megan, I'm unmuting you now. Great, thanks. Thanks, Amanda. So, um, hi, good evening, everybody. Um, George, I loved your part of the presentation and I was taking notes and um, I think it was actually kind of perfect in um, setting up some of what I did with my students. Um, and so I'm excited to be here and talk about how I have used the League of Women Voters really as a model for um, work that I've that I've done with my students. So I will say this year I'm at Rockville High School. Last year I was at Magruder High School. So the the examples from the project, um, I'm primarily drawing from my work that I did last in, in 2019. We started the project again 
in the spring of this school year, but then everything got blown up because of COVID. So, <laughs> um, but you know, that's life. Um, so, okay, so Amanda, you're controlling the slides, yes? Okay, all right, so I think we can go to the next one. Um, right, so like I said, I mean, this is exactly what George's students were talking about in their video, right? And um, we, we did, um, both years, a, a unit on really democratic practices. And our core text, one of our core texts that we used was this um, essay from the Atlantic Magazine by Yanni Applebaum uh, that's called Losing the Democratic Habit. And I teach um, AP Lang. And so we were using this piece both as a text for building background knowledge on this, on this topic and also we analyzed Applebaum's rhetoric um, and, and the argument that he makes itself. But this idea that, do, that democracy is an acquired habit, that we have to allow students to experience not just voting, but, you know, in, in the traditional sense, but actually like building in democratic practices uh, into our own classrooms and our routines and our procedures and protocols and all of that. Um, so I think, man, if we could go to the next slide, that's really, right, the question is, if, if we want our students to function in a democracy um, and we want them to do more than just vote, but to be actively engaged, what are those habits that we want kids to develop while they're in school? Um, so we could go to the next slide. And then, of course, putting on our teacher hats, how can we plan our instruction to actually foster those habits? Like what, how do we need to structure learning so that kids are engaged and practicing all those habits? So this also goes to what um, George's students were talking about, I think this would maybe be another piece of evidence, right? That in recent decades, Americans have fallen out of practice or even fall, failed to acquire the habit of democracy in the first place. And Applebaum argues that the best place to locate new schools of self-government is schools. And I think that's really powerful for educators. I mean, this is a guy, he's not a teacher, right? But he's saying, hey, listen, this is where we need to, to do this work. And to um, the point of, of one of the people the kids interviewed in the video, it doesn't mean just adding a civics class. It's, it's, that's a piece of it. And yes, it's important to know how like the different parts of the constitution and all that, but it's even more, it's, it's about getting our kids to go through the motions of democratic behaviors, right? Um, so, all right, so we can go to the next slide. So we called our project the consensus project. And really what we were trying to do, and when I say we, I'm not referring to myself and all my multiple personalities, but um, to my colleague, um, Anna, who at, at Magruder. So uh, when I was at Magruder, I worked with Anna. And then at Rockville High School, I worked with um, Krista and David. So when I say we, it's my, me and my colleagues. Um, because I didn't do this on my own at all. So we, uh, we developed this consensus project and basically this came out of my, my own uh, membership and involvement in the league and learning about the process through which the league arrives at those positions that they use to advocate. And I, when I learned about that process, thought this is, this is what we should have our students do. Like, these are the habits that I want my kids to develop. Um, and so it's really modeled after that process that goes on at the local level and the state and national, but um, really trying to tap into the local level process that there are committees and they research and they come up with consensus questions, all those things that we'll get into, get into in a second. Um, but that's, that's where it came from. Okay. So I think similar to um, what George's project was calling the voter guide, we were basically asking students to 
groups of students to come up with fact sheets. And what we did was, um, well, the, the fact sheet was, again, modeled after the Montgomery County chapter, like what those fact sheets look like and how they were balanced and how they present both sides or, or all sides of an argument. Um, they are, they include citations and it's really about establishing an understanding of an issue, right? So that was where I wanted our students to begin. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. And for AP Lang, this was really important because the fact sheet um, was really like our connection to the objectives of the course was to say, okay, a fact sheet is really about synthesizing information. It's bringing together uh, a lot of different pieces of research and trying to make sense of it and put it all together into one um, document. So that was the synthesis piece. And then the, the second half of that is, well, what do we do with that information? And so that was the part where we were, and, and I'll go into detail on this in a second, like we went through the process of writing the consensus questions and having the class vote and then doing something with that consensus, doing something with the um, agreed upon kind of, an well not answer, answer is the wrong word, position, let's say. Okay. So, the first step for the kids um, was to give them an overview of the process. And I could have stood up there, my colleague Anna could have stood up there. Yeah, you know, we, we could stand up there and talk about the, the league and what we know about it. But um, quite frankly, the kids get sick of us, right? And so like having someone else come in is always exciting. And it's, we are so fortunate um, to have Elaine Apter, who knows so much about this, the league, the process, um, government, like all of it. She's just an incredible resource and was generous enough and kind enough to come in and speak um, to our classes. And she gave like both years, she gave seven presentations in a day. Um, it was absolutely fantastic and the kids loved her and she did such a great job um and i knew that there are other league members who would be willing to do that as well and so having a league member i think come in and speak about the a little bit about the history of the league and also the process is just a nice way to get um, kids to understand so this year one of the things that we created and and it's hyperlinked in the slides and i know amanda will add it to all of the resources um, is a capture sheet. And that was really just a way to help the kids kind of follow along with the information, a um, little bit of an accountability piece, but also where they could write questions that I could um, ask Elaine after the presentation or that they could ask at the end of the presentation. Um, so that was a nice piece of that. So Elaine really sort of went over the whole overview. That was step one. So step two was, again, trying to imitate the process the league goes through and trying to build in those democratic habits. So we, as a, as a class, so every period I taught three sections of AP Lang, my colleague taught another three, every single section uh, brainstormed issues. Now, I asked my kids to think about issues that directly affected them at the school level. I know my colleague opened it up a little bit more to like state and national. Um, and I don't think there's a, a wrong or a right. My rationale for the, the school level was trying to create that parallel to what the Montgomery County chapter does, which is to look at local issues. And I really wanted to give the kids, I wanted them to look into something that they could advocate uh, their position with like school administrators or the PTA or their teachers or, you know, something very close to home. So that's why on this example, you'll see the list, you know, this idea of um, having an open lunch, the kids can't go off campus at Magruder. So that was an issue. Um, study hall was being discussed uh, at the school, like implementing a study hall the following year, standardized tests. So 
what we did was we just sort of brainstormed a whole list and then we kept narrowing through our votes, like through voting, right? So just, okay, let's come up with something that we all agree upon at the very end. So that's what we did at, at Magruder in 2019. This year, we tried something a little bit different, um, which was, and, and I'm giving you these options because, you know, all paths lead to Rome. Um, but we, it's hard to be a seven-year-old at 8, 12 at night. I'm sorry. Can you close the door? I did it. Nope. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, so anyway, it's like the new normal. So, um, right. So this year, what we had students do was um, on an index card, they just individually wrote down like, the top three issues that interest them. And then we put together, um, like I collected all those cards and then I looked for patterns. And so based on those patterns, that's how I grouped the kids together. And it actually fell out where there were like four or five kids in every group. So, so one year, like the whole class was working on the same issue. And then this year, we had multiple groups within the same class period looking into different issues. So it really just depends on, I think, your students and how you want to structure everything. So I'm giving a presentation. Would you like to be a part of it or otherwise you're going to have to be quiet? Thank you. You can say hello and then you're going to have to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. All right. So I think we can go on to step three, Amanda. Yes. Okay. So when we had the whole class looking into one topic, um, we needed to figure out like what it did need to break into groups. And, and of course, then from there, the individual accountability. So basically we said, okay, if we're looking into, um, let's say, I think in this example, what was this one? Logistics makeup of classes. I think this was the um, the study hall option. Then we said, what do we need to know in order to study this issue? And this was all, like all of my notes. This all came from the kids, right? I just prompted them with the questions. What do we need to know? Who do we need to talk to? What are the issues? And then based on that, each group kind of went in this direction, right? So they were all working toward the same issue, but researching kind of their own little pockets. Um, and then similar to what George was saying, I like, I like the color coding idea. I created a Google Doc for every group and then had uh, a student box, basically, right? So, so if, for example, um, let's see, EJ, Asahi, and um, who is that? Oh, Xander. They were working on one group, so I had one Google Doc for them, and they each had a box, and they put their research into that box, and that was my way of, of sort of tracking the individual accountability on the research. So that was step three. So step four was to actually have the kids conduct research. Now, in 2019, that was my first year actually having, you know, implementing this uh, project. And it was also my first year at Magruder. So lots of things to learn. And one of the things that I learned was that kids really don't know how to conduct research. Um, and so, so that was, uh, I realized that, you know, they don't, they don't naturally know how to email uh, a school board member. They don't naturally know how to set up an interview. Like these were skills that I thought that maybe they had that they didn't. So that was one thing that um, I realized like going into this year, we needed to back it up and just help them throughout the year develop the skills that we knew they would need to implement for this project. Um, one of the pieces that we added this year was an annotated bibliography, which um, I think was really helpful in in that it taught the kids what an annotated bibliography actually is and it also helped them sort of keep track of their research and know where to go back and find information but 
that was a piece that we added this year that I was, I was glad we added. So step five is actually putting all of this research into one Google Doc. Um, and so what I asked students to do was and this was before the whole class came together. So they have their they had the Google Doc where they had their individual research, and then it was like, all right, as a group of two to three students, you got to put it all together. And so that's what this piece looked like. So the um, the top box where it says perspective of Magruder High School staff, that was Gabby and Kelly, and you can see there they really had not completed much of their research. Um, the perspective of the parents, that group had completed more of their research, but they still needed some guidance. They still needed some help. So this was um, a nice way for me to be able to see where the holes in their research, where, where those holes existed and how I could help guide them before the finished product occurred. So um, this was also the point at well, I mean, there are many points at which I give them feedback, but where I would conference with the groups and, and give them that guidance on their research moving forward. So that was step five. And then step six was specifically looking at whether there was bias in their work, because one of the pieces, one of the very important pieces to the, um, the fact sheets that Elaine told the students and we emphasized over and over again was that we shouldn't be able to tell, a, a reader should not be able to tell your personal opinion or even like a, a particular slant when reading the fact sheet. It really should be objective. And it's meant to inform people so that they can draw their own conclusions or can do additional research to figure out how they feel. So the objectivity piece was really important. Um, and so we went through an editing process where we specifically looked for bias in their own language. Um, as a class, we went through, and this is a beautiful thing about shared documents. Um, we literally sat in a circle and pulled up each uh, we pulled up the fact sheet and each group looked at the sections and they, this is like my copy so you can see my pencil notes, but in the, no, like 15 minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, but in the class, like while we we're all sitting around looking at the document, we could actually have a discussion. And so if kids had questions, they could ask the group that wrote the document. And that was really powerful. I haven't um, actually done much of that kind of editing, but like sort of live editing, I don't know, simultaneous editing, I don't know, it was, but it was really great community editing. Um, but it was, a, it was, it was something that I would do outside of this project anyway. All right, so once we had our fact sheet, then we, the, the kids wrote their consensus questions. And this was interesting. Um, and I know, you know, Elaine warned the kids from the very beginning. She said, this is actually one of the hardest steps because you want to write a question or, or a statement um, that's not too narrow, it's not too broad, but whatever the consensus ends up being, it should lend itself to developing a position. So you can see here um, that for this particular fact sheet that dealt with the advisory period or study hall concept, these are the consensus statements the group came up with. And then what we did was, I think I'm in on the next slide is the, right, so, so that was, the consensus questions were part of the fact sheet. And then the next step was the kids read the fact sheet and then we voted. Um, now what we did was we, my, my three sections read all of the fact sheets. 
So we got that information. It, it then went beyond, the fact sheet went beyond just our class period. Um, and it actually went to the other class period so that we could say, okay, you know, Miss P's AP Lang class, like this is where we stand, um, all of our AP Lang students. I think on the next slide, it has, um, right, so this was our breakdown. So we had 48 kids vote. And you can see that on some of these statements, we there was absolutely a consensus. Like kids believed that offering an advisory period would benefit students. Um, there was no consensus on whether they should be, that advisory period should be assigned the same way as what they called basically homeroom, right? So this gave us a place to say, okay, we can, as AP Lang students in this school year, we can advocate for, we believe that an advisory period should be held more than once a week and that it would benefit students. Um, and then the other information was helpful actually in kind of determining what the kids didn't care about as much and what didn't really matter as much. Um, all right, and then I think we can go to the next slide. So the, the one piece that we didn't have time to complete and, you know, always in the first year of a project, like you, you think you're going to have time and then you don't. Um, and this is also why I really liked what George was saying with the video, because I feel like that the, the piece that I really wanted us to get to was creating something, some sort of product to use to advocate. And we didn't get there. We ran into the AP exam. But we at least had, we had the fact sheet, we had our position. Um, and so we were able, the kids were able to share that information, their opinions with people in positions of power. So in this picture, um, the person um, pictured is Stephanie Schwinn, who is the media specialist at Magruder. And she was also kind of heading up the committee for the school that was planning the advisory period for the following year and like collecting information. So we invited her to come in and the kids were able to like share the information with her, share their positions with her. And she was able to ask them questions and they could give informed opinions. And we could at least have that conversation even though we didn't have a chance to create anything like a product. Um, and that's what we were aiming for this year. This year we started last, at, in 2019, we began the project. We tried to do the whole thing in one marking period and, and it was the last marking period. So that was silly. So don't do that. Um, I would say, I would say you need at least like a semester because there, there are of course like other things you're doing and other things that have to be done. Um, so this year we actually started at the beginning of the first semester um, and really kind of got into everything like in February and the kids had their groups and they had finished their annotated bibliographies and they'd had discussions and then COVID and then it was like, great. So, um, so I think I would definitely advise a semester for the project and, and even like back mapping to the beginning of the year, thinking about uh, what I mentioned before, the, the research skills that might be necessary, like the interview skills, the um, maybe if you know you want them to end up creating something like a video or a podcast or or a poster, an infographic, like working that into the beginning part of the year so that they know some of those skills by the time you get to this part. Um, but I think what's really, really powerful about modeling this kind of work after what the league does is it is all about habit and it is all about teaching skills and not, and it gives, it empowers the kids to look into issues that they care about and hopefully get to that point where they can actually do something with that information. Um, and that's really, really important um, for all the reasons that we already know. So I, I think, was there one more slide? There might be two. Oh, right, okay, so yeah, so I had two more. Okay, so we'll go back one. This was like sort of the concluding quote from that same essay I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the American system of government functions properly only when embedded in a culture deeply committed to democracy. That culture sustains the constitution, 
not the other way around. And I just thought that was really, really powerful. Um, and then the last slide was, is just like things that I love um, <laughs> that relate to all of these topics. Uh, I will say that um, a house still divided by Ibram X. Kendi. Many of us have heard his name because he wrote, I don't have it in here, it's in a different room, um, how to be an anti, how to be anti-racist. And before that book came out, this, this essay, uh, How Still Divided, was in the same issue of the Atlantic magazine that the Applebaum piece was in. Um, and it's fantastic and it works really well with, um, if you're studying some of Lincoln's writings and speeches. Um, and then electoral dysfunction and election day are great. Electoral dysfunction is, um, they actually have a classroom version that's only about 30 minutes long and it is so perfect. It's, it's a brilliant piece of, of argument. Um, and then, yes, I think that's all I'll say. I will also, I'm going to plug, my last plug is going to be on tyranny because it's super, super short and fast. And it's so powerful and so relevant to everything going on today. And I think that's all I had to say. Thank you so much, Megan. I love how authentic the audience was for your uh, project. That was just amazing, especially how the culmination was actually to advocate to the, the policy maker. <laughs> So I just think that is so great. Thank you so much for that. And just so everyone knows, I'll be making all of the slides available so that you'll be able to access the hyperlinks as well from both George's presentation and Megan's presentation. So the last presentation is actually me. Uh, so I teach AP World History and AP Macroeconomics at Benjamin Banneker High School, which is a DCPS school. So I live in Montgomery County and work with the league there, but I decided uh, the league knows no boundaries. And so I have taken my league membership and tried to incorporate it into my teaching in DC. Um, I just had to share this picture of us in front of the Fed because we were the first high school uh, group that's my AP macroeconomics class. We we're the first high school group to ever get to meet the chair of the Federal Reserve. We got to meet Chair Yellen and Chair Powell. Just had to make a plug for that. And you never know where civic education can take you. Uh, you might be in front of Notre Dame uh, doing some, some civic uh, action. Who knows? So I want to talk uh, to build a little bit on Megan's uh, presentation. Megan talked about in her class how she used the method of the league creating fact sheets uh, in her class. And in my class, I actually kind of focused on the other end of fact sheets. So one part of the League of Women Voters that I think is a really cool part of the league is the discussion groups. Discussion groups are small groups of league members that meet monthly and they meet to discuss a, a fact sheet or some other resource. So when Megan was talking about uh, the, the fact sheets that she was creating, the league does create these fact sheets. And so we, in my class, we wanted to look at these fact sheets and create a discussion group in our, in our class. So this was a club that I had. It was a lunchtime club. And I'm sure I speak for all the teachers that seeing pictures of my students makes me miss school so much. I can't wait for us to go back, fingers crossed. But uh, so this is a group of my students in our discussion group meeting because discussion group was a little bit unclear. It made sense in the context of league, but we decided to change the name to current events and politics discussion group. Um, and so we used the fact sheets from uh, the Montgomery County League. So I made a couple of adaptations for my classroom. The 
Most important thing, I think, is that I shorten the readings. The fact sheets that the league provides for discussion groups uh, can be quite long. And for our purposes, uh, there were some parts of the fact sheets that weren't relevant to students living in DC, or maybe it was just a little bit too much. So I shortened the readings, but I did provide a link to the full text so that students would be able to access that if they wanted to access it. I wasn't sure if providing the link to the full text was really um, that important of a component of it, but I learned that it really was because after the meeting that you see here, which was on the census actually, um, a student actually used the fact sheet that we looked at and she applied for a scholarship uh, that was about why the census is important. And she actually was the winner of that scholarship. She used a lot of the things that she learned from the league. Uh, so I learned that providing the full text uh, is really important so that at least students can reference it later on. Usually for discussion groups in the league, people will read the fact sheet before and then they will come to the meeting prepared to discuss. Well, for our extracurricular club, we weren't quite all there yet. So instead we read uh, during instead of before the meeting. So this was another reason why I wanted to shorten the reading a bit. I would give us a 10 minute reading uh, time and then we would we're lucky that we have an hour long lunch so we would have a 10 minute reading time and then we would have the rest of about 45 minutes for discussion. Um, I did provide the readings beforehand it's just that usually students didn't have time to read them before the meeting started. We also decided to meet weekly. The lead discussion group actually meets uh, once a week but sorry, once a month, but our uh, discussion group, we decided to meet weekly because it helped increase student engagement. Um, because of this, we couldn't use the current fact sheet for the discussion groups that were going on with league because if the league only was meeting once a month, uh, we could only use their materials once out of the four weeks. So what we decided to do was that one time in the month, we would use the current league discussion group fact sheet. Um, and then we decided to use also the past fact sheets. So this March 2020 uh, was a discussion group on the census and we used an old fact sheet. And then I also incorporated student choice topics. So one of our uh, topics in March was um, how the primary system works, generally speaking, so that students could engage on that current event. So that wasn't using materials from the league, it was just kind of following the model of the discussion group. This was March 2020. And in April 2020, we had to go virtual. So one great thing is that discussion group can continue meeting virtually. So my school uh, and my district used Microsoft Teams and we decided as a discussion group that we should go ahead and continue meeting. So we created a weekly meeting, a Thursday lunch. You can see we just decided to keep that from whenever we would get to meet in person. And the cool thing is that we had more people join our virtual discussion group meeting than we had ever had actually come during lunch to our real life discussion group meeting. So we actually met uh, a couple times in April and then also in May, and we will continue to meet virtually uh, if we need to in the fall. You can also see that we had more flexibility actually with the meeting time. So this meeting uh, lasted over an hour 
because students could come and go if they needed to, but they mostly really wanted that connection in their virtual learning. So this was a really great project that can transfer to virtual or distance learning if that's something that will need to continue in the fall. So you've heard uh, today from Elaine and you've heard from three educators in three different contexts and three different content areas who have incorporated civic education into their classroom. And so now we have the fun part where you begin to think about what civic education could look like in your classroom this fall. So our league is committed to supporting your efforts, whether that's in person or whether that is a virtual or distance learning opportunity. So here are the next steps that we're asking of you. First, in the participant materials that I sent out to you last night, you can read about current opportunities for students to earn SSL hours with the league. Of course, a student can get involved with the league and not just to volunteer, not to earn SSL hours. We welcome student membership. And in fact, student membership is free in our league. So we would love for you to publicize this with your students. And if you know of a student now who would love to get involved with the league, we hope that you will reach out to them and connect one student with an opportunity that the league is offering. So you can read more about the specific opportunities uh, in your participant materials. Additionally, in your participant materials, you have been given a guided exploration of our national and local league websites. This is where you can find more information about the league and how you might begin to incorporate some materials from the league into your classroom. And then the really fun part is for you to develop a civic education project for your class or for you to adapt one of the projects that you've seen today and what it would look like in your content area or in your particular school. We're going to have our next session be on uh, next Wednesday, July 1st. It will only last from seven to eight. And that will be a time where you will get to speak in a small group and in that small group, you'll share about the civic education project that you have planned. You don't have to have a classroom ready project to share. Um, we're just asking for you to come with your idea and the feedback that you would like to get from other educators. So these instructions are intentionally broad because we know that you're the expert and we want to embrace your creativity. We think that the role of the league is to support you in your creativity and your expertise. So we want to give you all of that freedom. Some things that you can consider. Um, which league topics fit into your curriculum? So if you're a science teacher, maybe you want to look at the local league's work in agriculture. Like we mentioned before, Although making democracy work is the cornerstone of the League of Women Voters, there are also opportunities in a variety of different committee work. Um, additionally, you might think about which league materials could be adapted for use in your classroom. Um, you might think, would your project be most appropriate as part of a course, uh, the way that we saw George and Megan's projects, or would it be best as an extracurricular activity? We want to know how we can support you. Maybe it looks like uh, a guest speaker, the way that we saw Elaine going to Megan's class. Maybe it looks like a resource, like maybe we can connect the league voter guides with Georgia's students' voter guides and see how they could help each other. Um, and then we also want you to think about how your civic education project and how civic education in general might be able to go virtual during distance learning. So we don't know what the fall has in store for us uh, in Montgomery County or in DC public schools. And so 
we might need to have in the back of our pocket. What does this look like uh, even if we're not in person? Because we're still going to have uh, major events and major elections, for example, going on even if we're not in school. And so our students' engagement will still be so important. So as I mentioned, next week you'll present uh, your project idea to other workshop participants just in a small group and you can come with your own questions for feedback on your project and we can try to help you with that. I've given you all of the materials uh, that I've emailed out to you in your participant materials. And so now I'd love for you to share in the chat uh, this is the head, heart, and feet of uh, an exit ticket, if you will. So something you're thinking about, what you're feeling, one thing that you want to do, your feet are the action. So thank you everyone for participating. I'm loving reading the chat. It looks like people are really excited to incorporate some of the materials that they have learned about today. And it looks like we're actually going to finish a little bit early, which I was, had my fingers crossed for, because if you've mentally blocked out this time until nine o'clock, that means that you can have 15 minutes to go look at our websites and it won't take an additional time of yours. So thank you so much for participating. I encourage you to use the next 15 minutes to go take a look at our websites. And it looks just so great to see all of your thinking, feeling, and what you want to do. And we'll see you next week, same time, same place, 7 o'clock with Zoom. And we will get to hear a little bit about some of your project ideas.